want to thank the Minister for the opportunity to speak in this debate and I want to acknowledge indeed the very good work that he has done and I, I have absolutely no doubt that in everything that the Minister is doing in this area that he is incredibly well intentioned and is working really hard to try to improve the lot of the people who are in direct provision and that essentially is what we're all aiming for and hoping for and I also just want to acknowledge the fact that you can't respond to what we're saying, but I do appreciate that you have committed to taking on board uh, our comments, our views, our observations, our opinions, and that they are that you will take them in the best intentioned way also, and not a criticism of yourself, Minister, but certainly a criticism of the service that is there that we want to continue to improve. And you know, when we look at the numbers that we have, and at this point in time, almost 5,000 people currently in direct provision. And I have to say, in my view, they do exist in a dehumanising environment. They're unable to work, they're unable to attend third level education, and the most of them, while acknowledging the work that has gone on in Mosney, can't cook for their own families. And they do receive a very paltry amount of money, 19 euros 10 cents per adult and 15 euros 60 cents per child per week. And in a lot of occasions, that money actually has to go towards food, towards school books, towards school trips and outings for the children. So it's a very small amount of money. The figures that I have in relation to those that are in direct provision are slightly different to your own minister. The, the figures that I have are 40% of asylum seekers are in direct provision for five years. And I do acknowledge that has improved um, and some 20% for over seven years, I, but I do feel it has improved in the recent past. Um, no matter what, the damage that any long-term stay in these centres are doing is absolutely incalculable. And the key issues facing these people in direct vision are the duration of the stay, the impact of the environment that it has on family life and the right to work. I read with great sadness a recent newspaper article about a 16-year-old girl, a victim of violence in her own home country, chronically traumatised and suffering greatly in a direct provision centre in Ireland. Diagnosed with psychosis, this teenager's mental health deteriorated to the extent that she's had to be made a ward of court as her health was in serious danger. And this young girl and the 1,600 or more children who have grown up in the direct provision system have endured overcrowded conditions, social exclusion and psychological damage associated with living in institutionalised accommodation. We as a country can do better and we must do better by these young people. The current system is not fit for purpose and it needs to be replaced to enable asylum seekers to live with a greater degree of respect and dignity. I realise that direct provision cannot be dismantled overnight and it will take some time to get there. But certainly, I believe the end of direct provision has to be the ultimate goal. And our thoughts on changes are, that could be made in short and long term. In the short term, we need to create and build a humane system by fully implementing the McMahon report. And I understand that at the moment that the, the department is claiming that over 90% of this has been carried out. But in speaking to residents, as I have, I don't see that that much has changed for them. There have been some improvements, certainly, but it's happening at far too slow a pace. And I want to acknowledge that in some centres, the proper functioning cooking facilities have been introduced, uh, particularly in Mosney. And I think it's great that residents can purchase food via a point system. This absolutely needs to be rolled out. I think, importantly, an amendment to the International Protection Act 2015, permitting asylum seekers the right to work, is hugely important. And I think this could be in line with the provisions in the EU Receptions Directive, which permits asylum seekers to work if no decision on their application for asylum has issued after nine months. And during the consultation process, further working group, along with the long, long length of stay in the system, the right to work was one of the biggest issues that residents had, and I have come across that myself on a personal level. And these two factors combined mean that in reality, by the time people currently leave direct provision, they have become completely de-skilled, demotivated, and find it really difficult to enter the labour market. In fact, the direct provision system as it is creates huge dependency. 
I think it's important also to increase the weekly allowance to the amounts recommended by the McMahon report. An increase like this, I think, would have a real and tangible impact on the quality of life for those living in direct provision, allowing them a greater degree of choice and improving their own ability to participate in the community within which they live. I think it's hugely important that we begin to create a system that allows families and vulnerable people to have access to independent, not communal living, following a short stay in centre-type accommodation. Direct provision is no place for families and has been consistently criticised. In, in the longer term, I think we absolutely have to design a more humane system. One of the key differences of our systems when compared to other EU countries is the fact that it is operated for profit. And, and I do appreciate what you're saying, that uh, we, we have uh, cause for expressions of interest at this point in time, because while it remains a, a profitable system for some, it will not be humane. So, you know, because of that, I think the government, to a certain extent, has been keeping responsibility at arm's length. And it's, it, you know, while, while we've been contracting out the care of the vulnerable to private entities for profit, basically creating a modern day Magdalen Laundries. So we absolutely need to move to a system that you have suggested in your own speech, and I do appreciate that. Um, so I think putting out calls specifically for not-for-profit entities with experience is absolutely hugely important. The ultimate aim has to be to create a blended system, like that in Portugal, where asylum seekers following a short initial stay in a reception centre where their needs are assessed by an assigned caseworker who deal with all aspects of their, of their claims. And then they can move out into community self-contained units. Um, I just want to welcome the announcement also that you mentioned that legal issues around the extension of the remit of the offices of the Ombudsman and Ombudsman for Children to include access for residents in direct provision centres has now been clarified. I think that's hugely important. Uh, as the Children's Ombudsman has pointed out, 1,400 children are spending the formative years, formative years of their lives in direct provision in circumstances that inhibit their potential to thrive and curtail their full enjoyment of basic rights. And I want to acknowledge also that while the current housing shortage clearly creates a huge challenge in being able to access accommodation. There's also many other hurdles, particularly around education and the right to work. I just want to mention briefly the 2016 report on transition from direct provision to life in the community. And this report obviously highlighted the multiple challenges faced by former asylum seekers in attempting to make that transition. And as you pointed out, many people are not able to make that transition. They're actually still in the direct provision centre. And having endured years of living in the system, and it is known to negatively affect mental health, child well-being and family life, people are largely left to fend for themselves once they receive their status. They People have to navigate a complex array of systems as they attempt to move out of constitutions that have systematically disempowered them for many years. And, and, and that's, that's a key point, absolutely, in all of this. Those transitioning also face significant barriers in accessing education and employment. For example, the years spent in direct provision are not counted in terms of eligibility for back to education allowance. And finding even low skilled employment proved extremely difficult mm. given that participants had not been permitted to work for many years. And we're now seeing the very negative impact. And just finally, I just want to mention briefly the Air Powell Centre in Newbridge, uh, which is where I live, and I visited actually on Monday. And um, at this point, there are 68 people living there, including seven children under the age of 18. And I have to say, you know, being, even being in there on Monday, I, I was just very struck by the energy of the young people living there. And there's a lot of young men who have just completed coaching courses with the local sports partnership. And they were incredibly enthusiastic about wanting to contribute to their community. And the supervisors in the sports partners scheme would absolutely love to bring these young men out into the community to work with voluntary organisations, both sporting and otherwise. We have some festivals coming up. But unfortunately, yeah, I know that. No, I know. we've agreed it. Oh, that's okay. But, um, far be it be it for me to interfere in the interior. Well, you're interfering now. <laughs> but due to the guard of vetting restrictions, they were unable to do so. 
And, and I think that's wrong. They want to work, they want to participate in society, but they're prohibited from joining the workforce. Aisa Sow, who lived in the particular centre, fled from Guinea without her family in 2011. And she was interviewed recently publicly. And her description of feeling like a prisoner in direct provision is a reminder of just how hard the process is. She, her, her story ended happily as she was granted asylum and has now applied for her, her mother to join her. So she's lucky. There's no doubt that people in direct provision have sought asylum to protect themselves and their children in the hope of providing a more secure future. And in direct provision at this point, they are denied the capacity to live as a family, left waiting indefinitely for this future to begin, and we need to do better. Thank you, Minister.